All right, welcome. Second edition of the Melbourne Aces Clubhouse Chat. And I'm joined today by my great sidekick, Mark Woods. Woodsy, how are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm ready to get it in talking all things Aces today. We've got a big guest with us. There's no one bigger, let's be honest, than the GM of the Melbourne Aces, Justin Huber. Hubes, how are you going? Very, very well. And thank you very much for having me on the show. I am um, excited to be here. Fantastic. I... I want to introduce you, and it's going to be pretty quick. It's probably the quickest introduction you've ever had because you are a big leaguer. You uh, made your MLB debut on June the 21st, 2005. You're from Emerald here in Melbourne, uh, not far from where I live now, um, down in the southeast of, of Melbourne. Australian Baseball Hall of Famer. Obviously famous on the field with the Aces, but but now treading your path off the field in, in the GM role. Lots of accolades, but really what I want to hear from you is you have the best job in Melbourne. If you're a baseball fan, like, tell us about it. Why, why do you love going to work every day? Yeah, I, it's it's an extraordinary question because I, I feel very, very lucky to still be doing what I do. We've seen the Aces um, change in so many different ways from the fledgling start that we had in, in 2010, which if you can believe that we're – heading into our 15th year as an organisation. It's extraordinary just to see us still going from strength to strength, even um, for those who can remember our starting point at the Melbourne Showgrounds. Um, to answer your question, I, I love the journey that we're on. I love the building that we've done. You know, it's it's we're coming into a generation of players now that are playing for the Aces who don't remember not having an ABL. Um, and that's a significant moment in time because for the m- large majority of my career, um, you know, certainly when I was a, a kid growing up, the major inspiration and, and uh, driver in, in my aspirational uh, journey as a player was watching our local ABL teams, the Melbourne Monarchs um, out in the West and the, obviously the Waverley Reds um, in the East. And if it wasn't for those teams, if it wasn't for those players, if it wasn't for those heroes, those local heroes, I I wouldn't have got my start. And then fast forward to my own career, um, there was no ABL. So I spent the majority of my career not returning home after a Pro Bowl season to to play in the ABL and, and see that league grow. And it was terrible. Like it was a terrible time. People don't remember that now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was it was awful. It was um, yeah. There was nothing to be uh, excited about um, from a, from a spectacle, a professional spectacle. Um, you know, there were no crowds. There were no. And everybody spent ten years talking about how great it would be to have the ABL back. And so I'm very very proud to say that not only was I part of the organisation when it you know start when the ABL started back up. Um, but I'm extraordinarily, um, you know, uh, honoured to still be part of the organisation as we now grow the organisation, which I can say now, after 15 years, that we are doing that. Mm. Yeah, that's a fantastic intro and, a, and great insight for people because you're right. It's There was a time where there was no ABL, you know, in that time in between, and that was probably at the peak of of your career I suppose when you were over in the states um, doing doing your thing and I did you know, I was reading an article I told you this morning from the Herald Sun and you'd only been in the league you know since it started until that 2015 or 2014-15 season um, and then it was time for you to sort of hang up the boots and you, I know you had a few injuries and some things happened but nine years I mean you had big ambitions coming in You've seen a lot of change. You sort of came into an organisation that that hadn't been winning and then you actually came in and the Brisbane Bandits said, we're going to win four in a row. And so there was a lot of a lot of things happening. Is it just pride that you look back? I know there's a long way to go, but is it pride that you look back? You, you've won two championships, you know, attendance records through the roof. The ballpark looks brilliant. So much stuff's happening. Like you must feel so happy and excited particularly being a Melbourne guy and you know the the Aces blood runs through your veins I think so Mm. is it pride when you sit here talking about it oh there's absolutely an element of pride um you know uh, as a as a player 
not being able to play in front of home fans and be recognised at home as a as you know as a Melbourne ace. Like I think that's probably one of the things that's most inspirational about the work that we do is that we are actually creating local heroes. We're, we're creating players who actually do have a following and a profile and they are inspire, inspiring the next generation uh, of players to come through. I mean, you get the good stories like Travis Bazana signing as a first pick overall. You know, okay, it might not be the, the only, you know, reason that, that he got where he got, but the ABL played a role in his life. You know, and so the more of these things that we can do, the more of these opportunities we're creating. But I suppose, um, yeah, to answer your question, it is. It, it, there's a lot of pride in that. There's a lot, and there's a, certainly a lot of pride in seeing how the organisation as a whole has um, survived through some very, very tumultuous times. Like, I mean, it was, mm. it was pretty desperate there for a while. Um, we certainly have. Uh, we, we had the blessing of Major League Baseball backing the foundation of the league and certainly for the first six years we we saw what um you know a startup business sort of really looked like but following that you know it was it was uh, tumultuous it was stand on your own two feet time and um that's not easy when you're dealing with um so much uh adversity in the marketplace there's there's so much that we're competing against to capture people's attention um mm-hmm. and capture their their hard-earned dollars that they they want to spend on being entertained so we had to really really work hard on how do we actually put a product on the field that is exciting that is entertaining that is high value when there's so many other things to put your money to into and choose and, mm. and certainly melbourne ballpark has been a, a huge component of that like i mean there was not that long ago i was t- chatting earlier not that long ago when, uh, you know, uh, it was the white elephant of the sport in Victoria and, and people love to hate it. And ironically, you know, now um, 30 years post um, or over 30 years post it, it being built, it's in the best place it, it, we could ever hope for as, a, as baseball in this state. It's 20 minutes from the CBD. It's on the one of the major growth corridors in the whole country it's between two major airports it's 800 meters from a train station um it's pole position for growth it's the epicenter and no no sport that i can think of in the whole of sport in victoria would say if you ask them hey would you like 20 acres 20 minutes from the cbd every single one of them would put their hand up and say yes well that's what we have in melbourne ballpark and what we Everybody else is looking for land and funding to do projects. We've got the land. We're just looking for, you know, the the reason to 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 you know to work with our local and state governments, our national government, um, our stakeholders and sponsors and patrons to do more things um, to make it better for everybody and 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 the, and the aces stand in pole position to be the beneficiaries along with the community that we're building along the way so yeah we're very excited about it fantastic I, i've got oh my next question is really talking about the off season so i know a lot of people who follow the abl and and sort of whether they're big fans or sort of loosely follow baseball in this country think that the off season sort of people go go to hawaii put their feet up you know watch a bit of netflix but that's just absolutely not what happens and in fact the off season super critical and there's a number of key things that have to happen can you give the fans a bit of insight into what's been happening sort of over those win- winter months and i want to add something to this question talk me through some of the great people you've got out there in the organization some of them are, are volunteers some are in some capacity getting paid but what's been happening and who are the key people out there yeah look uh, i i don't ever use the word off season uh, if uh, for a front office for an administration you're always in um a, a busy part of the year um to answer your first part of the question um what have we been doing well so post post the abl season wrapping up for us unfortunately that ended for us in Adelaide, um, losing the ABL semi-final. Um, we rolled straight from that program into hosting the Hanwire Eagles. So we had uh, nearly a month of spring training out at Melbourne Ballpark, hosting hosting the Hanwire Eagles from the KBO. 
major Korean professional baseball team. We then parlayed that straight into um, the uh, um, Australia v Hanwha International Baseball Challenge that was pl- uh, International Baseball Showdown, rather, <laughs> that was played um, uh, out at Melbourne Ballpark in front of sellout crowds, mind you. It was a very, very exciting time. Um, from there, we hosted all of the BV uh, finals and, and uh, finals program, including Super Saturday and and and, uh, and the Division One uh, and Two uh, Grand Finals as well out, uh, out at Melbourne Ballpark. We went straight from there into the Australian Women's and Youth Championships. And you know, when we talk about key individuals, uh, I think people don't realise just what the Aces staff do when it's not necessarily a game day so there were times uh you know when you were seeing all of our front office flipping burgers um <laughs> you know for the awcs or or you know getting getting the place set up for the uh for the hanwha series or um you know helping hand out trophies at the bv final so we we were we're in it we're looking at doing more things and more events at melbourne ballpark we're looking at trading more days. I mean, if you're just trying to run a business off 20 home openings each year, you'll go broke. So, um, you know, we don't we don't rest on on the ABL. We we launch ourselves straight into the next event and the next event and the next event, as well as building all the things that we need to build, um, both physically at the at the stadium, but also as a team. We've got a whole team to recruit. We've got a whole, um, you know organization to plan and and prepare to put on the field and all of that takes time finding players finding places for them to live finding uniform new uniform suppliers um you know getting those things ordered delivered your merchandise set up all of those um key things that you see seamless on a game day uh during the season that take takes months and months of preparation and we're doing all of that whilst also doing all of these other events we also spend a lot of time working on our business in terms of the financial fundamentals. Um, we really only have four key areas of, uh, of revenue, um, being ticket sales, uh, merchandise, um, concessions, and sponsorship. <clears throat> the off-season is really about a lot about sponsorship. You can't sell a lot of uh, you know concessions during non-event days, so you really have to you know focus on on the long and slow build of, of your sponsorship portfolio, renew renew those who are coming back. You, your big ones you mentioned uh, on last week's show with Light and Easy. Um, yeah, you've got to spend a lot of time keeping a lot of people happy. So there's a, a big focus in the area uh, in the off season of on sponsorship. And then you come down to the people that do that. We've got you know a very small team. You know we've got. Just a, there's just a handful of us um, that are there day in and day out, including volunteers. So, um, you know, the biggest name that comes to mind these days is your dear, dear old mum, who uh, comes in most days to uh, help help us uh, with not just the merchandise, but anything else that needs um, doing around the place. Your dad's out there building away as well. Um, yeah, Mick uh, Mick's got his hands full at the moment on uh, on building the uh, an upgrade to the canteen. Uh, so, one of the great problems we've had recently with uh, you know all the extra attendance that we've been getting is that we can't actually serve people fast enough at the canteen. So, Mick's uh, doing a great project at the moment that will mean that we can serve people faster and they can expect that experience at the concession stands to not inhibit their their time awesome. watching the game and interacting with the bit that they've come mm-hmm. come there most for so uh, so that's a huge project um luke and mel um yeah my right and left hand <laughs> left left hand most of the, most days they uh they have been working really really hard uh in the backdrop you know luke you know he's got a huge task at the moment with uh, uh, working through our new ticketing platform we just had to, had to change over from tickets.com to a new a new supplier so he's had a you know devil's own job getting that up and up and going um, and Mel's running all of our social media um, constantly throughout uh, the year um, as well as working on sponsorship and you know and, and and all of us are wearing various other hats at times to do you know bits and pieces on important projects that that need doing so 
Um, so that's us at the moment. Now, uh, we did have to farewell Jonathan, who, um, yeah, was, was another one of our full-timers who, who had to go back to the, to the U.S. Um, uh, it's a big role uh, we're about to fill there. He was a bit of a jack-of-all-trades like we are, but primarily focused on ticketing, and he was the smiling face you saw at the box office. So we far- farewelled him a couple of Fridays ago, and, um, yeah, we'll be looking to, to fill his, his shoes too. And that's it. That's us. You know, we have, um, we have a raft of other important folks that come in um, – a lot during the year at spits and starts mostly around the around the season um from broadcast and production um to the game day entertainment um even to our canteen staff and volunteers of which woodsy you uh you spent a lot of time um up in the booth this year with uh with tony shebecki and the crew that that handle all of our our production um so yeah I, i couldn't not mention um, all of those folks that uh, that do do those important seasonal seasonal tasks, um, and then of course, um, you know, none 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 more important than our uh, team owner uh, team owners Brett and Sean Ralph, who um, yeah, who who make what we do possible from for, on a lot of levels. Um, their uh, their support, both um, in person and uh, and financial support. Also, their mentorship and their um, just general love for our organisation runs deep. It provides the bedrock that we need to be able to um, do what we do. So, so we're very lucky. We're small, but we're nimble, we're quick, and we punch way above our weight class. So, yeah, we're we're, we're yeah we're we're looking to be uh, the organisation that everybody has wished and hoped and um, believed that we could be. It's happening now. Uh, you've already touched on some of the key things that I was about to ask you in the yep. next question in regards to ballpark changes or ballpark work sponsorship. But is there anything that fans can really look forward to in the upcoming season, anything in the league itself? Or just tell us about the upcoming season, anything the fans can expect? I think you, you're going to really look forward to see just the dial being turned up. You know, it, we're looking at you know, how can you provide something better than what was already the best last year? You know, that's the moment that we're in, you know. Um, and it's a really, uh, you know, it, it's a proud moment to to be looking back. There was a time where, you know, as a, as a starting out GM, you'd be looking at Brisbane and you'd be looking at Perth and you'd be going, how are you getting so many tickets sale? How, what, what can we what can we learn from you? You know, tell us, tell us your secrets. How can we put in play what you, you guys are doing in your markets? Well, that's us. Now, those teams are looking at us going, how do, what are they doing that, that uh, we're less inclined to share uh, a lot of our secrets these days, but, uh, but that's another story, but we are, you know, we're the front runners. So we, we're in this unique and awesome position where we're going, well, how do we do it better? How do we turn up the dial? And so, for fans, that's what you'll expect to see this year. You'll expect to see that if you thought it was exciting last year, just wait for this year. You'll you'll be blown away. That sounds ve- that sounds really exciting. Mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you to that, Justin, <laughs> when I'm out at the ballpark, and I'm gonna yeah. high expectations, Mick, yeah. if you're listening, which I'm sure he will. Mm. I I'm I'd love to hear about. One of the key partnerships, and of course, partnerships mm. in your business, as you said, are, they're just everything mm-hmm. because they're one of those four key pillars for you. Uh, and that Hanwha partnership has become super critical. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure how much you can tell us, but can you mm. talk us through? So you hosted them. It was their spring training. It was about mm. a month. And I, I'm in a great position because I get to hear sort of some of the great training mm. stories and day to day, how they went about things from, yeah. from my dad. And so hearing about the professionalism of that mm. organisation and what they brought out to the ballpark and how they, they did things just even in a day-to-day environment was, was amazing. But tell sort of the listeners, what was it like hosting them mm. and what's that partnership mean to baseball, not just the Aces, but to mm. baseball in Melbourne? Yeah. They were such a super organised and professional organisation. Um, they certainly their expectations 
raise the bar in a, in a lot of ways, um, and and in ways that we will stand to benefit from um, seeing how they did things from from an organisational perspective uh, gave us a lot of insight. I mean, it's it's one thing to have been around that or that type of environment before, like I, you know, during your playing career, I, I have had that experience. It's another thing to just simply um, articulate that to people that necessarily haven't seen it versus actually show them what it looks like in your own ballpark and have it demonstrated on a day-to-day. Um, so we we were really lucky to have that opportunity hap- happen for us this year. We are expecting that it's all going to happen again this year. So I, I can disclose that um, yeah, all, all signs are pointing very much towards uh, Hanwha coming back, although I can't confirm that today. We're, we're working daily um, on, on replicating the format um, and, and enhancing it um, uh, for this year and, and, and with a vision you know, for it to be a, a perennial thing that you can look forward to on your, on your baseball calendar each year. In terms of importance to our organisation, um, it's and and the wider community, uh, it's one of the more exciting things that we're doing. To be perfectly honest, um, and on not just a, a you know a local level with with the baseball in mind and the spectacle and the event in mind, but on the you know the 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 level that hits you know local and state and national government. Uh, agendas and 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 puts into focus um, our sport in their minds it's playing a much much deeper role um, a lot of the listeners probably wouldn't realize that the Hanwire Eagles are part of probably the sixth or seventh largest um, you know, corporation conglomerate uh, in South Korea you know they're they're only just behind the Samsungs and the Kias and and these types of massive um, businesses Um, so they do a lot of things they own a lot of things they run a lot of different companies and strategically one of their companies um, has a major partnership you know in with the Victorian and and Australian government um, in our region and on the side of that comes Justin and the Aces um, who have managed to uh, you know do a, a, a deal directly with the Hanwire Eagles to come and use Melbourne Ballpark and and play these games and have this, like to to the politicians and the and the business leaders and that are involved in this this whole scene, they're looking at us like we're superheroes. You know, they're they're looking at us going, oh, how cool is this? Our, you know, one of our, our team has coming here and going to be here and putting on some games, and I can bring all of our staff, and you know, we can shake hands and we can we can do all these great great things. And it's it's there's a you know sort of word out there at the moment that's a sort of a buzzword amongst f- folks that I I do business with uh, regularly, and it's it's one of one of sports diplomacy. Um, you know the high value of sports diplomacy in our proud sporting state in Victoria is um, is something that you know is is uh, uh, seen as high high value, and we're we're realising that on a, on a on a local level with the Aces um, at the moment based on based on that relationship. So yeah, we've uh, it's exciting to me personally. It's exciting to our organisation. Um, it's exciting to the businesses and partners that are involved, um, and it's in, it's exciting to our state government who who backed us last year to put on the event. We got great support from uh, the, our minister for sport, Steve Demopoulos, um, who came out and threw out a first pitch. Um, so yeah, the the spotlight's on the the program again um, this year, and. Um, I'm working very, very hard in the background to make it possible, uh, not just for this year, but for for future years, um, and really expand the vision of of having more and more KBO teams come to Australia, specifically Victoria. Uh, How can we do that and um, make this a real firm part of what we do and what we deliver as as a sport in this state? Um, So... Going back to the ABL, uh, talk about the evolution of the ABL. So it's... Big changes since the uh, the return 
if you will, in 2010, 2011, which mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure you were part of the mm-hmm. start. Mm-hmm. So, and you retired at the end of the 2015 season. What was that like? Talk mm-hmm. us through what you've seen as from the playing days mm-hmm. uh, right up until now. I mean, you've been through it all. Yeah, look, <laughs> it was... Um it was fledgling at the start. Like, you know, those who have connected enough to us would would have seen, you know, the recent evolution of the team and the ballpark at Melbourne Ballpark, but it's it's easily forgotten that we actually started at the Melbourne Showgrounds, bumping in and out of, um, yeah, an arena that we had very limited access to, um, was hugely cost, cost ineffective, um, had um, some really challenging working environments including you know supersonic dance music festival that would float in there every other year and equitana you know i remember clearly one year we spent all this time and effort building this uh you know infield on on the show arena and um you know while while we're on the road um you know equitana came into town and basically they ran horses across the infield and and chewed the whole thing up so there was just these really challenging operating environments that meant that that wasn't just wasn't a long-term um strategy um it was cool for a couple of years it was a heap of money spent that um good for home runs too great for home (laughs) runs had a lot of cheap ones there in my time there um you know so to see see the organization at, at those days um and the ABL as a whole at that time to now, it's it's quite a quantum leap, really. Um, you know, but some things haven't changed. Like the guys, you know, the guys still drive the team vans on the road themselves. <laughs> yeah, we don't have bus drivers or concierge service just yet for them. Um, so there's still elements that are, that are very much uh, the same. Um, but from... You know, from a from a stability and 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 team perspective, um, the attendance is much stronger than it was. Um, the the players are much well looked, much more well looked after these days. The the front offices are much sturdier, and that can be seen in in the experience from the fans. I laugh with Mick quite frequently um, because um, you know we we have various moments in time when we're working on a project or working on an improvement where somebody will come in and say, oh, you've got to do this, it looks terrible. And in the context of, um, yeah, what it looks like now, yeah, they might be right, but we laugh because there was a moment in time where whatever that improvement was at that point, it was probably the best thing that was there, <laughs> you know, at the time. Like, and, and, yeah. You know, when you look at the, the areas of the ballpark, like the uh, the picnic areas and the party deck and the, you know, and the and, and the garden areas where people can casually come and sit and have something good to eat from a food van or, or whatever or, or an elevated position where they can casually sit and look over the field y- you soon forget that actually that those were dusty old uh, almost flea bitten areas <laughs> that no only people that uh, were looking for a sneaky cigarette were, were, were going to and now they're really family friendly uh, great places that we've been able to develop Yeah, mm. well, I just want to I'm going to go off script here for just a second, yep. but the one of the things that I've seen that, that mm. hasn't necessarily changed but, in fact, has been enhanced is the willingness and, and the love of players to come out here. And I, I was really lucky. I got to talk with Greg Bird when he was in Mexico yep. <coughs> only about a month ago, and, and he, he genuinely loves the organisation. Mm. Like, it, the way he was talking to me about how much he cares about the aces and and he wants to help the aces and he wants Mm. to be part of a championship and and help do all the things he can both on and off the field i just thought it was from a guy who's played you know big leagues with the Mm. yankees and he's played all around the world it was really refreshing and it it was exciting to hear how much he loved like what's it like hearing those things from your players oh hugely important um and hugely heartwarming i mean it's 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 much of the same sentiment that keeps me driving to work every every day and we're looking for people to get wrapped up in this build like you can go to any other established uh baseball country in the world and the effect that you can make on that team or that market is pretty minimal even for a person who's who's was well established in the big leagues as greg bird but he can come here and 
smiling at a kid and signing an autograph makes a difference. You know, even something as small as that makes a difference. And then open your mind to what else is possible if you just roll up your sleeves and give give it a bit of a nudge yourself. And I suppose that's what we're looking for the the most in our next period of growth is how many more folks like that can we attract? You know, because um, because some of us are getting a little bit tired. We need we do need some yeah we do need some new blood and some new people that are really inspired by what we do, um, and that's only natural. Um, but to find people like Greg Bird who who are buying into that way of thinking and that concept and can contribute. It's the reason we're here, to be honest. We're looking for the next generation of advocates. We're looking for the next generation of passionate folks, the next Mick Werns, the next Annie Werns, who can come in and go, right, let's let's roll up our sleeve and let's give it everything we've got to make this place bigger and better than it was. Yeah, it, it's, as you said, it, it's great having those advocates. And, and he's a, around the world mm. telling people how great Yep. the ABL is yep. which is great for the ABL but he's telling them how great the aces are so it's a credit to you and to the the crew you've got and what you've established particularly mm. from a cultural perspective uh, I'm keen to hear about and I'm sure the listeners are that the state of the ABL now so we've yep. talked about it fledgling at the start mm. you know things have changed we, we've had a few sort of big investments over time from some key people who've come in to play a role but is there an opportunity and I already know you're going to say yes, potentially, but from a com- commercial perspective in a really saturated market in Melbourne, like what are what are our opportunities? How are we going to, you know, going to compare and going to go up against the, the BBLs and now the WBBLs and the A-League and the, yeah. and the Storm and how, how are we able to, to push ahead and continue to grow in a market where there's so much competition? Yeah. It's just got to be a value proposition. You know, we've got to constantly fight <coughs> to be of more relevance both to the hip pocket to the, but as well to the, the high entertainment um, value. Our region, as we discussed earlier, plays a huge role in that. We actually, although Melbourne is flooded, the western suburbs is not. And so we have to continue to take an approach where I have a throwaway saying that I say people sometimes laugh, don't obviously twig sometimes until much later, but I say regularly you can build a stadium on Mars, you've got to get the Martians that live around the stadium to come, and that's what we are doing, That's and that's probably the biggest driver of our growth uh, beyond anything that's... Um, that's uh, less obvious is that the folks that are coming are coming from, you know, primarily the western suburbs. Whereas when we started out in 2012 at Melbourne Ballpark, you know, there was an awful lot of eastern-based folks uh, that were driving across the bridge. And how do you grow an organisation asking people to drive that far, day in and day out? So, so we've had a really big focus on on our local catchment, and I think that's starting to really catch on, pay dividends, and that'll be the next next generation of growth or i have no doubt um moving on to i guess you as a gm and i guess harking back to you as a player do you have any superstitions as a gm that you might have had as a player i mean you can talk about your player superstitions as well uh no superstitions uh i prided myself on not having um too many when i played um, in fact, spent a lot of time bagging guys who, who did. <laughs> um, but I do have some. I did did have some odd things that, um, as a GM, that I that that the staff and folks at the Aces know all about. So I'll, I'll tell you one specifically. Um, there was a gum tree. And I called it my Sunday tree, right? And everybody never knew, used to know what I was talking about. So if the cars in the parking lot got past this certain tree um, on a Sunday, I was happy with that because it, it was like, okay, well, we got we got past the Sunday tree today. That means we are, well, it's a reasonable attended opening for a Sunday because, of course, Sunday's traditionally a pretty difficult uh, game to, to draw fans to. Well, a number of years ago, that tree disappeared. Let's just say that. <laughs> And um, and it's no longer the Sunday tree. And then the one that was fur- a little bit further down the car park, that became the Sunday tree. 
and we we soon were piling cars far past that and then let's just say that tree disappeared as well and now we don't even talk about the sunday tree because there's no such thing because cars on on the on sundays go all the way down to the end of the parking parking lot and um yeah so that i could you could say it's not a superstition <laughs> but that was uh one of my what a quirky thing that was uh relevant to me being a gm yes <laughs> Now, we had some questions from the Aces fans thanks to Facebook. And one of them was, what was your favourite team or organisation or even country you played? Oh, look, I... I... You have to say the Aces, don't you? Oh, of course, (laughs) yeah. Well, Apart from the Aces. Yeah, Asterix. um, (laughs) Yeah, apart from the Aces. um, Favourite country to play in? Look, every country that I played in had, you know, some amazing features i spent the most of my time in the u.s obviously and and you know the u.s in terms of uh west coast to east coast uh southern to northern to midwest um they all they could be their own countries in and of themselves so i I had some tremendous experiences in all of uh, my time for different reasons in the u.s um i really loved playing in japan i had a you know i had a almost a closer to home uh, experience there just with uh, the time zone and the fact that there was a he- heaps of expats um, in Hiroshima where I, I played. Um, I had a, one of the coolest baseball experiences I ever had playing in uh, the Dominican Republic and, uh, and Venezuela um, and, and various Australian team trips and it took me all the way through South America and, and to parts of Asia and and, and and so forth so I'm I'm pretty lucky to have seen most of the country most of the world on the back of uh, baseball um, yeah to, to narrow it down to uh, to one or two I, I loved playing uh, the time that I did get to play in um, against the Cubs in at Wrigley Field in Chicago um, that was one of the coolest baseball experiences I had just from the you know, the history of the place, the nostalgic sort of, um, you know, uh, associations that come with uh, that that facility. It was really old, really traditional. Coming out of the clubhouse, you walk through this sort of uh, narrow kind of, um, it was almost like a coal mine. It had these <laughs> lights hanging in the dim and you sort of burrow your way down through the, through the ground. You don't even know where you are for most of the walk through it. Um, and then you just pop out in this, um, you know, dugout that, the greats from Ted Williams, Babe Ruth, you know, all the greats had played uh, in this stadium and walked through that same passageway. Um, yeah, it was really quite an amazing place. And then, you know, all the obvious features like the, you know, the the um, uh, the, the ivy on the home run fence and even some quirks that they had local to that ballpark, like the apartment complex across the road that had built its own set of bleacher seats um on the top of the building and now actually uh you can buy a ticket to go <laughs> you're not even going into the stadium you're going up an apartment across the road too. yes yeah yeah i mean that that whole sort of scene is uh it was one of the cooler baseball experiences i've ever had um going on to the cooler baseball experiences to the baseball experiences you've never had yeah. where is somewhere you would have loved to have played but never got the opportunity to oh uh, look <sighs> I had a real. I got a really bad. Um, I got a really bad uh, Yankee Stadium uh, story. So, um, it, you know, I was my big league career. You know, w- was pretty s- uh, sporadic. You know, I, I, I had parts of five years. A lot of that time, I was playing off the bench. I'd get called up for you know a handful of weeks. I'd get sent down. Uh, you know, I was sort of that four A kind of journeyman type type got spot filler type type of a guy. Um, so there was a handful of trips that, that I missed. I, I never got to play in Boston and I never got to play in New York. Uh, those are pretty big, big ones on your list of, uh, you know, ballparks that you want to tick off on your MLB career. Played against those teams at home, at the home teams that I played against a bunch of times, but never actually got to go to those two places except for Yankee Stadium. So Yankee Stadium, I was, uh, I'd was i missed the trip to Yankee Stadium when I was with Kansas City. I'd get traded to um, San Diego, who are in you know, the National League, and don't play the Yankees, generally, except for the year that I played there, and they had 
yeah, the Yankees in interleague. So I'm like, awesome. And they were in, you know, it was in, I think, June or July. So I'm spending the whole year just looking forward to going to Yankee Stadium. I'm like, I'm going to get finally get to get to play in Yankee Stadium. We get there and um, we're facing Andy Pettit, left-hander. Now, I had been playing against all of the left-handers. You know, I was the in that team, I was the right-handed bat off the bench and my only starts would be when left-handers were on the mound, right? So we got Andy Pettit. I'm like, sweet, I'm going to be a lock for the lineup tonight. So Buddy Black normally would have put the lineup out, you know, before batting practice. Um, and, you know, usually many hours before batting practice, so everybody knows what they were doing. Well, the lineup doesn't go out. So I'm sitting around going, uh, it's getting, you know, hour before BP, still not out. Half an hour before BP, still not out. 15 minutes before BP, still not out. And I'm just in the locker room and uh, I get called into the office by the general manager, Kevin Towers. And he said, look, it's a tough move we've got to make, but we've got to send you down to the minor leagues. Um, so I got sent down on the day that we're in Yankee Stadium on the series and I never got to play. So you never got <laughs> to take BP either? I took BP. Oh, you did. I did take BP. Oh, well, I took early BP. I didn't, yeah. Yep. Uh, so I did get to stand there and launch a few uh into the seats and um i did have that moment but um yeah i never i never got to uh i never got not to have an official at bat at yankee stadium unfortunately oh Mm. that that is such a shame but i guess continuing on this discussion you obviously spoke about playing minor league and major league all over usa except for new york and boston unfortunately You also had the chance to go and play in Japan. What was that experience like? Talk us through the differences between USA and Japanese baseball. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, it's 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 profoundly different. Um, Japan, there's almost there's a, there's a really famous book uh, called "You Got to Have Wa," and I recommend listeners go out and get that book. Um, yeah, I'll say it again: You Got to Have Wa. It's cool. It's a very really famous book. It tracks. It's sort of a bit, bit of a Mr. Baseball story. It tracks the the life of a of a, a, a written by a, by a guy who experienced life as a Westerner coming and playing Japanese style baseball and all the crazy stuff that sort of in the early days of that journey. Because it was yeah, it was only relatively recently that you know that Westerners started to go to that to that league and and the MPB opened it up to to foreigners so um yeah that that wasn't such a well well trodden path uh until relatively recently and my experience there was pretty pretty similar like there was some ways that they practiced and trained that were just the total opposite of how you were taught to play baseball you know and had trained your whole life so <coughs> a big a big difficulty um for me was uh, uh adjusting to that I, I knew enough about it to know what to expect and 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 did adjust um but yeah it was it was it was very different um an example of that was batting practice like you know you know u.s team batting practice normally was you know no more than five swings you might take you know five to seven rounds of batting practice you do your early work in the cage you'd, any extra swings you'd you'd manage your uh, your workload so that you were peaking for the game. Um, and that usually, you know, you're talking about an explosive sport, you're talking about high impact, um, swinging the bat as hard as I can. You're training for that sort of, um, that that ball's coming through the zone and I'm going to hit it as hard, as hard as I can. That's your whole mentality as a Westerner. Well, in Japan, their mentality is almost like if I could explain it like Don Bradman hitting the the golf ball up against the with the, with the stump, it was almost like that mentality, and they trained almost like they were running a marathon rather than doing a sprint. So their batting practice was um, you'd face you'd have three stations, um, and they were all timed. Um, so you'd do five minutes on um, side flip. So you'd have somebody flipping up um, the ball to you. Um, and then you go from five minutes of that to five minutes facing a right-handed batting practice pitcher. And then five minutes of a left-handed 
batting practice pitcher. So think about going from training, swinging as hard as I can for rounds of five swings. You know, maybe five of those. You might have taken 25 swings to spending 15 straight minutes swinging a bat. Like all of a sudden, you 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 take yourself from a sprinter to a to a middle distance runner to a marathon runner pretty pretty quick in that context, and your body changes, your, your muscles act differently, they slow down in you know some settings. Um, so it was that was a really big adjustment for me. Yeah, and and other players that I know uh, too would always complain about the same thing. But that was a really clear example of that difference in philosophy. 15 minutes. Uh, when you said five minutes yep. and I was thinking of doing toss for five <laughs> yeah. minutes, like yep. I'm just a lowly club hitter. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. You like, do that every day. Wow. Yeah. That's just good. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've spent time over there and sort of watched yeah. a lot of training and seen how they do it. And it's really interesting <laughs> hearing it from and how yeah. that must have been difficult yeah. from a playing perspective. Yeah. I want to move on to the big question and this yep. is the question on every aces fans lips mm-hmm. how's the team looking leading into the season yeah look we're it's it's looking great but you can always say that in august <laughs> right um no but it is look we we we've got we're not making any announcements on purpose at the moment but we've got some good players you mentioned greg greg uh, he will be coming back um We've got others that that we're looking to sign, as well as local guys. Um, yeah, uh, there's some some re-signings, some farewells, um, and some yeah ex- exciting overseas acquisitions, um, like there is every every year. But uh, yeah, we're the organisation that w- we are going to be competitive. There's 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 these dark days of. Um, not being able to put put a competitive team on the field behind us, our front office is not going to put an uncompetitive team on the field. We just won't. Um, whatever that takes to do that, we're going to do that. So um, that's a guarantee that that we can afford the fans. Um, um, so so we're going to be right there when when we need to be. Um, but there will be some yeah big players and big. Big exciting announcements coming down the stretch. Absolutely, we'll all be following that. That's mm-hmm. great news. Mm-hmm. I, I mentioned at the start of our chat, you were mm-hmm. quoted. You, you did an article for the Herald Sun, mm-hmm. and it was in February 2015. Yep. And you retired. You just retired. I think you played your last game on the weekend. Yep. And you were then announced pretty quickly as the next GM. Yep. And you were quoted as suggesting that. One of your biggest attributes coming into the role was that you understood what the game looked like, mm-hmm. how the game felt, how it smelt, mm-hmm. and and what you needed to deliver for fans yep. to turn up yep. and love baseball. Mm-hmm. Uh, last year, biggest mm-hmm. attendance, uh, record attendance mm-hmm. for you and mm-hmm. across the league as a whole. Mm-hmm. Ne- what's next? Like, yeah. how do we take that and do we grow even more? Yeah, a- and hang on before you yeah. answer. Yep. Do you think you've been able to to do what you said? You know, you you wanted to do coming in. Uh, look, I, I I'm proud and happy of what we've achieved, but I'm absolutely not content. Like the days when we're getting sellout seasons, I'll, I'll be happy, right? Um, the days when we're building extra areas to house more people at the stadium I'll be happy Um, and but I still won't be content (laughs) (laughs) Um, have we have we have we gotten a lot better at delivering a competitive product Uh, absolutely Um, where do we go from here Um, we assess that every every off season we go what do we do well what do we do poorly how do we deliver that better how do we make this example of the canteen is a a perfect one that's inhibiting people's experience at the ballpark how do we make that better and do it now so that next year it's not a problem Um, we do that every year and we're going to continue so with that mindset i think growth is conducive um, and we're also looking for those X factors along the way, as we always do. You know, those Greg Birds, those good stories that, that bring people out. You know, 
Delman Young was a great one from previous year. There were people that were coming to watch. I heard it in the hallways. Hey, Delman's playing. So, like we, heard, we we saw it. So um, the more of that that we can secure along the way, the better chance we 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 have. Um, I think we do a wonderful, wonderful job of engaging our fans 12 months of the year now. I think that's a significant change in my, my time. Um, you know, when I first started out, it was very seasonal. It was, you know, we were really relevant for three months. Well, you know, how we act online and, and, and the profiles that we've grown on our social media channels um, just indicate that our fans are thirsting for more um, and, and better engagement and more of it and um, more, more things to talk about more often 12 months of the year. And so um, I, think, I think we're doing a really awesome job with that. Um, I think our broadcast is the best in the league, hands down. Um, we pride ourselves on getting good um, people in the booth every every year and putting on a crisp, clean... Ed White, we're a mainstay of our, our broadcast, has been instrumental in crafting such a clean and, and professional product. Our partners at Sportscast Australia, who have shot more baseball than any other production company in the whole of Australia, which seems like a small thing, but it's actually a very significant thing because anybody with a streaming um, you know, technology and, and a... You know, uh, bit of a bit of a background in putting on a, a live stream can throw some cameras up and and make it happen but are you going to shoot baseball how it needs to be shot to make it look the way it needs to look and be engaging and watchable and something that people actually want to tune into well, that's a different story and that's sports cast they do a better job than anybody there so you know we we've got a long way to go with that and to grow that even further than we have and i think it's it's getting more and more and more um, watchable and and accessible than it ever has been before. So that that that's something that that um, I'm very proud to say our organisation's achieved in my time. Awesome. Uh, so for anyone listening that hasn't actually been to a game out at Melbourne Ballpark, what would you tell them in the hopes of getting them along to a game or a series this upcoming se- uh, season? Come. Come for the entertainment that comes with live sport. Come expecting that you can get something awesome to eat, that it's going to be affordable, that you're going to see professional athletes on the field um, performing their sport at the highest level in the country. Come for those. Come for those reasons, but stay to fall in love with with what we mean to our community and the position that we have. Um, in our community and the things that we're going to do um, as, a, as a growing organisation to make your time um, and our time better together and the price that we charge more valuable every year that we can to you as our customer. Um, fall in love with, with us for those reasons and we'll, we'll say that we've ticked that. Yeah, <laughs> say that we've ticked that box. If that doesn't get people out, Woodsy, I'm not sure what will, but it's a, it is a great... Uh, entertainment piece out there so for people with families and kids and to get up close to the action Mm -hmm. at an affordable sport too you can't do do much more than you you can out there Mm -hmm. we have a new segment and we sort of started this in our first chat with with Aaron who was fantastic and we've called it bottom of the ninth with light and easy so we're coming to the end of the pod and we've loved our chat so far Justin but we want to quiz you yep with the hard-hitting questions the first one is What's your favourite Aces jersey? It's the blue, hands down. Right. Love it. Um, I look. I do. I like all three of our jerseys. But yeah, when we when we brought in the blue, I just went, wow, that's that's crisp. That's clean. Yeah. That looks like a that's a big league uniform. Love it. What's your favourite part of the ballpark? Is there a place you go? I mean, there's lots of upgrades. Do you go on a Friday for lunch and sit in on the party deck or are yeah. you out it, at sitting on one of the stools? Like, where do you go at the ballpark that you love? My favourite spot, if I say it, people start looking for me to be there. <laughs> <laughs> but before the game, I always love to stand at the top of the stairwell and... Um, right up at the top of the back of the grandstand on the first base side. Um, and I love that part of the ballpark because not only can you see the crowd starting to fill in the stands, but you can also see the cars 
um, you know, filling up the car park, the people coming in through the gates, getting greeted for the first time. You can see, you can see the, see the excitement starting to build and the buzz starting to build. Um, and and I really stand up there looking out there like how how cool is this? Like I, I really when you see if you see me up there like know that I'm stand, standing there thinking how cool is this? Like we're this is what we've built. Like this is these are the people are coming and giving us their money to come and be entertained by our team that's out there on the field right now and all the stuff that we're doing with a smile on our face to to give you a great time. That's happening right now. Um, and I stand up there looking out there with that mindset. So if you see me there, that's what I'm doing. Well, I can actually <laughs> confirm he does stand there because <laughs> yeah. last season with the door open to the booth, I could see the, every game you were yeah. standing there. So yeah. that's definitely, yeah, um, yeah confirmed. Yeah. True, your true story. Spot. True yeah. story. Yeah. What's your favourite Aces memory? Oh, that's a really hard one. Um, winning the winning the championship in uh in our first year in 2020 that that was that was absolutely uh so hard fought on a variety of reasons it was the you know just a, a matter of weeks after we won um oh, the world turned upside down with covid and we spent the next two years just wondering if we'd ever play baseball again um so that that's that that's my favourite memory. Yeah, we just that was so hard fought. It was um, Brett and Sean's first year um, as team owners. Um, yeah, it was just it was such an effort to play that season with the you know our best and biggest foot forward that we could, and we did and we won and it was awesome. It was so much fun, yeah. and we and we did it in Adelaide and we beat Adelaide in front of their own fans and yeah. I'm sure that will happen again soon. <laughs> What's your favourite part of the game? What do you love about baseball? Is it is it the home run hitting? Is it the the defence? Is it the pitching? Like, is there yeah. a part of the game that you've always loved that you still love? Yeah, I love the strategy. I love the the cat and mouse that goes with, you know, hitter versus pitcher. Um, but then I also love just playing along with the managers and figuring out what move they're going to make, make next. Um you know, had I have not gone into uh, the front office, I, I would have had an interest in, in following a managerial pathway. I always, you know, as a former catcher, I was always thinking along with the managers and thinking along with the game um, and trying to be a step ahead. Um, and so I, I would have had some interest in, in doing that. But I still like watching baseball and just, you know, especially if I know the, the managers and know how they sort of, I'm a bit disconnected from MLB these days to look at it in the same light, but certainly watching our local league now and 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 the guys that I know, um, yeah, it's still f that that part of it's still a lot of fun for me. Yeah, awesome. And last question, mm -hmm. maybe the most important of our podcast. Yep. Your favourite go-to light and easy meal? What oh, is it? Chicken katsu curry, hands down. And yep. I reckon if you got one other person on this that's close to you onto this uh, podcast as well i reckon he'd say the same thing but i'll steal his thunder before you do get him on uh chicken katsu curry no doubt <laughs> great answer and a big thank you i want to give a shout out to light and easy a huge supporter of the aces and have been for a number of years and we've got a code at the moment save 30 percent on your first delivery Aces base is the code, so check that out and um, and stay connected to the the Aces Facebook page for all those details as well. Justin, it's been a blast having you in. Some great insights for for the fans out there, and we're pumped for the season. Thank you for coming in. No, thank you. We are more pumped than ever for this season, so I can't wait to see you guys out there as well. And uh, yeah, I just can't wait for the first pitch to be thrown. It's uh, it's only a matter of weeks now, so. Um, get on and get your tickets and, and get the best seats you can um, and don't miss out. We'll be there. Go Aces. All right.